Okay. Welcome everyone. I'm excited to be joined today by uh, two really outstanding physician scientists, Mark Hamilton, MD, PhD. He's a hemonc and cellular therapy fellow at Stanford University and professor of medicine at Stanford, Ash Alzide, uh, leader of the cancer genomics program also at Stanford. And we're here to discuss their recent New England Journal of Medicine article, the risk of second tumors in T-cell lymphoma after CAR T-cell therapy. That was recently released in June 13th, 2024. A uh, very exciting report, and uh, we wanted to learn more from them about what drove this particular study and how they were able to use the Mission Bio Tapestry platform to further inform the conclusions of the study. So thank you both for joining. Thank you for thank having you. time. Um, I'll give a big picture overview and then have uh, Mark dig into the details. So this study was... Um, uh, kind of prompted by the announcement by the FDA around Thanksgiving of last year of the risk of second cancers after CAR T-cell therapy, in particular T-cell lymphomas that can arise after administration of um, CAR T-cell therapies. Uh, and at the time, there were six approved CAR T-cell therapies when this announcement was made. Um, this made us think about this problem in terms of how prevalent this problem was and had us examine our experience at Stanford since 2016, um, looking to see how many patients we'd given various cell therapies to and how often we saw second cancers. Um, in that exercise, in looking at over 700 patients and almost 800 cell therapy infusions, uh, we found a group of 25 patients that developed uh, second cancers. And among those 25 patients, uh, we, we really focused on the single patient, one patient with a T-cell lymphoma, who unfortunately succumbed to that T-cell lymphoma um, within 60 days of her treatment for a B-cell lymphoma. Uh, so Mark led this study in studying her case at very broad and deep um, um, genetic and genomic level, including by the Tapestry uh, Mission Bio platform to look for evidence of how the CAR T cells may have participated in the formation of this secondary T cell uh, malignancy. So I'll stop there and have Mark go on. Yeah, so I, I was fortunate to be joined by my colleagues, Takeshi Sujio and Troy Nordenboss, under the lead of Dr. Eliza Day and Dr. Miklos for this study. Uh, and as Dr. Eliza Day said, the major question was the frequency of these tumors, um, especially secondary hematologic tumors and how they come about. The major tumor studied was a T-cell lymphoma with the concern being that CAR T-cell vectors could cause a insertional mutagenesis and lead directly to a T-cell lymphoma forming. And so it was very important for us to understand the origin of this specific tumor, how it came about and why we were seeing it in this patient and whether we were finding the CAR T-cell vector embedded within the tumor. Thank you for that overview. Um, so let's go back to sort of the inspiration for the study. You know, uh, Dr. Eliza Day mentioned that uh, FDA has labeled CAR T-cells with this particular warning uh, of secondary malignancies. Just in more broad terms, have you seen, do you feel like this has set the CAR T-cell um, therapy uh, industry back? Has this been something patients have been concerned about? And, you know, I think it will lead into the conclusions of your study and, and whether or not the, the concerns are founded or maybe a little bit uh, over presumptuous. I'm just curious of your opinions on that. Yes, so the... And because it got so much publicity and press in being an FDA announcement and now a box label for these therapies, it's often the topic of a conversation. 
with patients and even referring providers and to educate about the magnitude of the risk and so on. Um, the, uh, the, our study and several others now kind of give a better sense of the magnitude of second cancer risk overall after CAR T-cell therapy, um, with most of the studies capturing that risk to be relatively small um, and comparable to risks in the context of other therapies like autologous stem cell transplantation as the historic standard for in the same setting for many of these patients. Um, and um, so given the cur their curative potential, we generally still substantially find more um, evidence for benefit as opposed to risk and advise the patients to get cell therapies in the right indication. Um, that's not to say that there isn't risk. There is risk. Um, and that risk seems to manifest in several different ways. Um, from our study, it looks like the CAR T cells don't have to directly cause the T cell lymphoma. They can do so indirectly. Uh, but some of other studies have shown the effect to be direct. Um, and for distinguishing between these, um, one key instrument that was critical for us was cell level, gene level, vector level analysis with tapestry. So, yeah, that leads us to the next question. So, Dr. Hamilton, you, you obviously use an entire uh, portfolio of different technologies to analyze these cases, and this one particular index case specifically. How did you and the team come up with this portfolio of technologies, and, and how did that sort of guide your conclusions, I guess, I want to say? At Stanford and Dr. Miklos's and Elisa's lab are very fortunate to have a broad array of technologies that we've been working for several years now to implement in the CAR T cell space and really also just focused on the question of kind of secondary cytopenias after CAR T cells. Um, and so we were fortunate to have a large portfolio of technologies available to us. And it was important to us to really not just show you know, to show, to ask the question how we should look for these secondary tumors and how they should be investigated in the broadest sense possible. And uh, we leveraged multiple methods in this one patient to, to perform a very deep analysis. And so we ultimately looked on the RNA, protein, and DNA level for the axi cell vector using multiple techniques, including capture-based sequencing, uh, which is a DNA level assay that can tile across the axi cell vector, simple qPCR, which is also a DNA based assay, single cell RNA sequencing, which allows us to have single cell resolution to directly identify the tumor in a population of cells, um, flow cytometry, which is a protein based assay, allowing us to look for uh, expression of the axi cell um, protein at kind of a more single cell resolution as well, um, but with lower fidelity than some of the more technically complex single cell assays. And then the mission bio instrument, which allows us to distinguish the tumor based on cell surface markers. And again, as a DNA based assay tiled across the array. And so what we were to, able to take all of these technologies together and see is that at the protein, RNA and DNA level, uh, using multiple techniques that would be very unlikely to miss um, any fragmented insertion of this vector uh, or cryptic insertion. We did not see axi cell in this T cell lymphoma at all. Um, and so this provided kind of both clear evidence that axi cell was not directly contributing by vector mediated uh, mutagenesis but also kind of provided a blueprint of strategies and how you could look for vectors in um, using multiple techniques in future tumors that should they arise. And then I think the second important thing is these technologies don't only capture the axi cell vector, but also many other genes. 
Um, and so using these capture-based sequencing technologies, initially we were able to distinguish the original large cell lymphoma from the T-cell lymphoma, showing definitively that they were two different cancers rather than uh, one cancer that had performed, undergone lineage switching. Um, we were able to show that there were two originating or there were several originating mutations and genes called DNMT3A and TET2 that appeared to be present in both tumors. And then importantly, uh, using the tapestry analysis, we could actually locate these kind of clonal hematopoiesis mutations that tend to exist in patients that uh, are older or have pre-existing DNA damage. Um, and we could show that those were likely existing in the hematopoietic stem cells uh, based on the fact that they were existent throughout multiple lineages, uh, including myeloid and T-cell in this patient. And we could show that these were directly contained within the tumor, suggesting an underlying susceptibility for this patient uh, to, both, to both tumors. And so she was just likely very susceptible to developing these malignancies, unfortunately. Thank you. And so, you know, it, it, would you, is it accurate for me to say that you would conclude that the clonal hematopoietic mutations contributed to the transformation of the T cell lymphoma? Is that an accurate statement? Yes, I believe that that's accurate. They were likely an underlying susceptibility that contributed. Um, and, you know, the, the tumor is clearly, very clearly derived from uh, a set of these mutations, really three, two, and the gene, a gene called TET2 and one in a gene called DNMT3A. Yeah. And both of this patient's tumors were EBV positive. Is there any speculation as to the role of EBV in the transformation of the T-cell lymphoma? Yeah, so that's accurate. And notably, this patient had underlying autoimmune disease and uh, patients with underlying um, immune suppression, which she had been on for many years, can be susceptible to EBV activation, causing secondary lymphomas, including both B and T cell. And so her B cell lymphoma was also EBV positive. Uh, and so this viral reactivation probably within uh, these already mutated cells led to a diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And notably, there is a known immune suppression associated with CAR T cells. The major cause of non-relapse mortality in our CAR T cell patients is not these secondary tumors, it is infections. Um, and so uh, it's possible that the CAR T cells contributed to an immune suppressive environment or the lymphodepleting chemotherapy or just all of her chemotherapies that she'd had prior to this that led to EBV reactivation inside the T cells and the same kind of um, mutated subset of cells that led to uh, proliferation overgrowth and subsequent additional uh, mutation in this T cell lymphoma. And so we believe EBV was active in both tumors uh, and was kind of a cause of this uh, happening. Right, right. Dr. Elisa, I don't know if you have any additional comments. Yeah, I guess big picture regarding the original question, you know, it's when you don't find something, um, it's fine, it's it's difficult to be definitive because uh, absence of evidence and evidence of absence are not totally, you know, mm -hmm. the same thing. So the way we approach that conundrum was to use a whole suite of methods to be sure that we're as broad and deep as possible. So as Mark mentioned, first starting at the protein level is the vector expressed on the T cells. Second is the RNA scene when we have RNA data. Third is their DNA level evidence. And to do that both at um, bulk level and single cell level with sensitive methods, and then also in cell-free nucleic acids. Uh, all the co that collect the collection of that evidence, I think, is pretty strong um, to show strong evidence to show that it there is no direct role for this vector in integrating into this tumor, uh, unlike the other tumors where the same that the where the vector has been found, um, and then with regards to how what made this tumor tick. Um, 
in the absence of, you know, individual things that we could perturb and a mess with, it's very hard to be definitive about it. But the circumstantial evidence really points to the things Mark were talking about, the chip mutations, the, e the shared EBV infection by both tumors, the shared chip mutations, and the immunosuppression, um, both in the B cell lymphoma and then immunosuppression in the context of the CAR T therapy for the T cell lymphoma. Uh, exactly which of those three things is the most important? What's the stepwise order of events to make a T cell tumor? That's much harder to answer. Um, but I think kind of as Mark said, this study sets up a blueprint for how you would use technologies like this to study future patients. We should learn from every single such patient as rare as a phenomenon as this is to um, read the tea leaves of what happened to avoid this risk for future patients, to intercept such lesions at the earliest time point that we can so we don't have lethal outcomes like we did for this patient. Thank you. That leads me to my next question. You know, is there is there a more you know systematic way to either screen or do surveillance for patients like this that would take some of these things into account? Um, you know, perhaps there's at some point there's only so much you can do, I guess. But do, you know, you'd still like to know if these things are evolving in the background. Do you think single cell technology specifically have a role in that sort of? you know, pre-treatment assessment or surveillance or perhaps both? Um, I guess for us, this patient and future patients where we know about certain features that we identified here and it seems like are being found in the other studies of these T-cell cancers, viral infection, clonal hematopoiesis. We knew about these and immunosuppression. We knew about these beforehand. For a future patient of mine that comes to clinic who has these shared features, it's going to make my antennas go up and think about this risk. Now, um, I don't think I'm going to ever suggest that we not give CAR T therapies when those risks are there, but to be hypervigilant about the, the risk. Now at Stanford, we routinely evaluate for um, car dynamics uh, as part of the research studies that we're doing, uh, but that's not routinely being done. Um, those involve usually flow cytometry based characterizations of cell expansion um, through the course of therapy. Um, and if the CAR T cells were to persist and expand in ways that we didn't expect, um, that might make you worried about a CAR T driven cancer that's caused by the CAR T cell. But what about cases like our case here? Um, I think the things that we saw here were the dramatic expansion of CH in the liquid biopsy studies, the dramatic expansion of EBV, uh, but these happen so quickly that it's hard for me to imagine a workflow today even with the cutting edge tools that we have of routine monitoring at with real turnaround times to leverage tapestry or other methods um, for routine use. Um, I guess, you know, more rapid clinical grade assays that are executed in as lab developed tests and CLIA labs and things like that could be very valuable for car dynamics and CH dynamics, um, but they're they're only emerging now. Yeah. And both us and others have also kind of looked at some of these pre-existing like clonal hematopoiesis mutations, and they they can be quite common. And I think you know an important question will be which ones tend to become uh, malignant or cause problems. Um, but it may be infeasible to track that many mutations if they are as common as uh, some of these studies are showing. And, you know, importantly, in a very aggressive cancer like large cell lymphoma, uh, the risk of a secondary tumor is, of course, um, very low relative to the risk of 
the aggressive lymphoma progressing, especially using a curative therapy. It is important to note that as CAR T cells kind of come out into newer areas uh, with non-malignant diseases, including autoimmunity being one that I think many people are excited about, some of these this risk benefit ratio may rebalance some, and you may uh, take into consideration these pre-existing susceptibilities if you have other available therapies that may not perturb uh, as much the immune environment or cause some of these risks. But um, I don't think that we really know those patient populations well enough. There's not enough patients yet to study it thoroughly, but it will be an important topic moving forward um, that will be informed, of course, by our studies and um, aggressive diseases where we have much more experience. Excellent. So I'll just wrap up and, and um, my final question would be, beyond Stanford, what do you think could be the impact of this particular study on CAR-T development and treatment and surveillance in general across the broader community? you think there's a message there for other centers as well? You know, we're, we're discussing with other centers now, and it's important that our study is just a single patient, uh, though it was a very large cohort of patients, and it gives us some idea of the rarity of this. Um, I think that other centers are also quite attuned to these risks and are looking in their own patient populations. There was a companion paper uh, out of, I believe, the Dana-Farber that came along with our study showing an indolent T-cell lymphoma that was silta cell positive um, published at the same time. And so um, I think that our study kind of informs this conversation. And certainly, uh, you know, we, we would um, engage with the greater community regarding these cancers and how to go about studying them on a uh, multi-institutional or collaborative level um, so that we can really understand these risks better as, you know, as a scientific whole rather than just a single institution. Dr. Lisa, I don't know if you have more to add. I think that's right. Um... I think trying to to apply the same set of tools that we describe here to other cases to understand them, I think would be quite valuable. Uh, as a practical consideration, I think some of the things we did here may not be equally feasible at other centers. If they did not viably preserve second cancers, it's hard to do tapestry on them, right? Uh, so we would encourage our colleagues in the community to really work diligently to um, build the research protocols and consent and bank specimens from unfortunate tumors that arise, secondary tumors, um, so that they could be studied with high precision using the tools uh, that we and others I'm sure will will be talking about. Um, um, because uh, identifying, we didn't find the, the CAR T cells in these tumors, but it for those that do, where did the CAR T cells integrate? What are the nearby genes? Do allogeneic products need to be uh, vetted for not having had such integrations? Do autologous products need to be screened for such integrations before they're... These are all open questions over time. That, and as we learn more to kind of refine cell therapies, and I'm sure all the companies are thinking about these questions. Absolutely. Well, that's all my questions for today. Unless either of you gentlemen have anything else to add, I wanted to thank you for your time. Thank you for your work. And thank you for continuing to pioneer the field of cellular therapies. Thank you. And thank, thank you for also for collaborating in in really helping us analyze these data with your tools and uh, helping us interpret the results. Um, thank you. It's a pleasure to work with you and your team. Thank you.